So I am happy to see all of you here on the second day of our work. For those who joined us just today and doesn't know all the participants yet, I will present myself. I'm Roman Romanov, Director of Program Human Rights and Justice of IRF, International Renaissance Foundation. I have the honor today to moderate the presentation of a discussion. Our today's agenda is as follows. It differs from yesterday, so we'll have a discussion all around uh, the national mechanisms and how the mechanisms of international justice can be applied at a national level. We won't just have an abstract discussion of the possibility thereof. We'll talk about the research that's been just published in Ukrainian. Last year it was presented in English. We have here at the panel in front of us people who contributed to creating this wonderful book, guidebook, choice for justice. This is a Ukrainian version. It has two volumes. In fact, each of these two volumes is a separate individual fully-fledged research. We printed out the volume number one that you can purchase today. The electronic version is uh, encompasses both parts of the research. First of all, I'd like to present our first speaker, the person who was setting together this guidebook about the mechanisms of bringing to justice for grave crimes. So, Eric Vitti, Senior Manager of Project on National Justice on Grave Crimes of, of uh, the Open Society Legal Initiative. Before joining the network of Open Society, Eric worked as a consultant on international relations in the, com in the team of the president of ICC. Before that, he was a political advisor of the prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone, where he developed the strategies of bringing to justice the ex-president of Liberia, Liberia, Charles Taylor. He also worked in a coalition for international justice in Washington for the political strategy against ex-president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic and uh, bringing him to the International Tribunal on former Yugoslavia. Apart from his other research, he is an author of this one and uh, several more. I'd like to give the floor to Eric to open our panel today. What was the idea? What what does this research bring to our context? How relevant is it, taking into account where Ukraine is today? Maybe this will bring together our today's discussion and what we talked about yesterday. Please, Eric, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Roman. It's uh, great to be here today. and. Um, Glad you all could make it. Um, so we heard a lot of discussion yesterday um, about the limits of the International Criminal Court, um, even though uh, I think there was a broad consensus that it makes sense for Ukraine to ratify their own statute, um, that there is prospect for some measure of accountability uh, through the ICC. Um, but in the best case scenario, we're talking about uh, a handful of cases that could take years um, to see through uh, at a very remote court. Um, at the same time, we heard that there are uh, dedicated local prosecutors um, who are, and, and investigators, uh, people on the front lines uh, of accountability work in Ukraine, doing their best to make the local system work and yet they face very many obstacles. Um, 
And so one question is, how to sort of bridge this gap? Is there room for another mechanism? And as Ukrainian stakeholders discuss that question, that's where this handbook, Options for Justice, we hope can be of some assistance. Um, it, whenever any uh, country or society is looking at creating a new accountability um, mechanism, there are all kinds of questions about what that mechanism should look like. Um, and luckily, there's been a tremendous number of experiences around the world, uh, in every region of the world, especially since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and we can learn from those experiences, and those designs. Um, what worked, what didn't work, what worked well in one particular kind of context that didn't work so well somewhere else and why. Um, those are the kinds of questions uh, we tried to look at in this handbook. And, and to be clear, we were looking at questions of design, um, not how is a mechanism led or operated, but at the design phase, um, what, what can be done to give the best prospect uh, for success of a new accountability mechanism um, through its very design. And so, um, as, as Roman noted, there's, a, there's the main section of the handbook uh, that tries to distill lessons um, from 33 different models around the world in 29 countries. So some countries have had more than one accountability model that we looked at. Um, and that wasn't even comprehensive. I mean, I think when, when people think about uh, lessons to learn from, people are thinking about the Yugoslav Tribunal, Special Court for Sierra Leone, you know, Rwanda, a few others. Um, but I think there's, there's not a real appreciation for the, the breadth of experience here. Um, and so, so we did try to distill lessons from, from this huge range of experiences. Um, and then in Annex, uh, which is the, the larger volume in, in Ukrainian, um, we profiled each one of these 33 mechanisms. Um, and the lessons we drew are in nine different areas, starting with, you know, what is the purpose of the mechanism? You know, is it a, is it a mechanism, for example, that intends to have some kind of truth-telling capacity? Uh, should it um, have other links, links to, to additional um, transitional justice uh, mechanisms that may be underway or processes? Um, does it aim to leave lasting uh, capacity in the country in question, or is it just there to deal with a handful of perhaps particularly tough cases? So that's the first question. What is, what is the purpose? And that, the answers to that question really inform every other question of design um, that we looked at. So next, what is the jurisdiction of, of the new mechanism? You know, what, uh, What's the geographic jurisdiction, um, temporal jurisdiction? Uh, who are the individuals it has in mind? Is it meant to uh, target all perpetrators, uh, only the uh, perpetrators of the gravest crimes, only the most senior perpetrators? So all those questions come into play when you talk about jurisdiction. Um, another big question when it comes to design is what is the relationship of the mechanism to the existing uh, domestic justice system. Um, and there have been a range of experiences from the completely international ad hoc tribunals um, to uh, very heavily internationalized hybrid tribunals like uh, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, to models such as that in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina where internationals were inserted uh, into a domestic system. Um, to fully domestic uh, investigations and prosecutions, uh, such as in uh, Argentina. Um, then what is its basis of authority? Is it, is it something that's authorized you know, by the UN Security Council, as was the case with the ad hocs? Is it something uh, established by agreement between the United Nations or another international authority and the government? Is it something that's only established under national law? Um, so there are a number of, of lessons around that. Uh, where is it located is another design question, and if it 
uh, is located in country as opposed to out of country? Is there just one main location or are there perhaps multiple locations around the country? Um, sixth, what are the structures of the mechanism um, so that it can fulfill its purpose? Uh, seventh, you know, if there are to be international judges and staff, um, there are a number of lessons and, and I would say uh, there have been a number of negative experiences with international judges and staff, a lot of mistakes to learn from. You know, how do you get uh, internationals who are really going to add on, uh, their expertise in a meaningful way in, uh, to the country. How do you do that in such a way that it doesn't, um, or at least it minimizes resentment um, that can build up between uh, internationals and nationals working side by side? Um, so there are a number of lessons in that. Um, you know, how, is the, how is the mechanism financed? Is it financed wholly in, by the international community through the United Nations or another structure? Uh, or domestically, or um, some mix of that. And finally, um, what forms of oversight are there um, internally and externally to keep the mechanism on track uh, so that it doesn't uh, suffer from scandal um, and, and inefficiency and a waste of resources? So these are th those were the nine areas we looked at. Um, and in looking at that, it becomes apparent that there are very few lessons that apply across the board in every country, in every situation. There are some, I would say. Um, so for example, it's a pretty universal lesson uh, that whenever there's an accountability mechanism, there should be a capacity for outreach uh, from the very beginning. Um, and outreach meaning an inter a capacity to interact uh, with the affected community, especially, um, to share information about the mechanism's mandate, what it's doing, what it's not doing. How do you counteract disinformation campaigns that are uh, meant to undermine its mandate, its uh, efficacy? Um, so outreach, I would say, I've, has been an across the board lesson. Another one is um, you know, the importance of defense and defense rights. Uh, that's been a hard lesson learned in some experiences. So for example, in East Timor, the international community poured in tremendous resources to investigate and prosecute um, alleged perpetrators of war crimes. Um, and then they showed up in court and they had no defense counsel. And the international community, or they had local defense counsel who were, had no idea uh, about international crimes. And so you had a mechanism designed to fight impunity for grave crimes that uh, was uh, severely violating fair trial rights of, of those accused. So um, I would say that's another important across the board lesson. And then as I, as I mentioned, the need for effective oversight, that's another clear lesson that I think applies uh, in any situation. But beyond that, I think when you look at these nine areas of design, uh, you're not looking at, you know, these, this is the list of things you should absolutely do and these are the things you absolutely shouldn't do. It's, it becomes a question of trade-offs and balancing and adapting these lessons for, in this case, the Ukrainian context um, and looking at what makes sense and what doesn't make sense based on what kinds of crimes were committed here, uh, what capacities uh, Ukraine has, what level of political will is there, where are there um, the greatest needs, uh, where are the greatest obstacles, and really adapting these lessons. So there can be, for example, trade-offs um, also in the ambition. So if you could have a trade-off if there's a desire to have something that's going to deal with a great number of cases, that is going to have, uh, a, you have to balance that against the increased cost, right, and have a serious discussion about that. Um, if you're going to introduce internationals into your system or try to do that, you need to think about what effect does that have on the legitimacy? Does that enhance the legitimacy because, um, because society feels that they would have more trust because there are perhaps international judges and, and officials w working within the system? Um, or does it hurt the legitimacy uh, as is the case in, in many places? So for example, in, in 
a lot of African countries, places with a living memory of colonialism, this tremendous sensitivity about the involvement of internationals. And involving internationals can, can do more to hurt the legitimacy of, of a mechanism uh, than to boost it. And so that discussion needs to be had in, a very, um, in the very specific context of the country in question. And, and these are the kinds of things uh, we hope the handbook um, can help Ukrainians think through as they look at, at options for this country. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Now I give the word to Fidelma Dalton. Yesterday, you already had the pleasure of uh, listening to her speech during the discussion at one of the panel sessions, but she is also very experienced on working with the national mechanisms in Sierra Leone, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and in Kosovo. So, Fidelma, how the experience that you had during creating various models, we're talking now, not the assessment, but the design, implementing the national system as efficiently as possible, implementing into the national system the accountability system and uh, avoiding impunity for gravest crimes. The lessons that you've learned, that you brought with yourself, what do you think we should know? Which would you share with us? Because we are on the onset of the discussion, of a public discussion. We are, it's just pending, this design is pending. We're thinking about the role of national participants. What are our expectations from the ICC and what other models could fill the gaps that we have today and that we discussed yesterday quite a lot during one of the sessions of the conference, please. And once again, thank you very much to the organizers for the uh, kind invitation to attend this very important seminar. So for uh, my remarks today, and I'm drawing upon some of the sessions from yesterday, in particular the sessions led by our Ukrainian colleagues, I would like to concentrate on, uh, firstly, um, the critical milestones as well as the authorities responsible for the establishment and the functioning of the war crimes and economic crimes specialized chambers in the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'd like to touch upon that today because I felt in closing yesterday, there was an extremely important remark made by our colleague from ICC, which is that ICC is not responsible, does not have the mandate and does not have the funds to reform national criminal justice sectors. There may be a space and a scope for positive complementarity in the sense of some forms of assistance at a certain juncture, but my strong advice is, and when I discuss this in terms of the critical actors in Bosnia, the real focus now is identifying international partners that are here in the Ukraine that can work together with national authorities and civil society to contemplate and advance um, the advocacy that may well be required if you want to proceed with um, some form of specialized system involving international participation. Secondly, I'd like to touch upon why and when the war crimes chamber in Bosnia was established. I feel this is important because again, as I mentioned yesterday morning, I personally was brought back to 2001 in Bosnia when many of the challenges that were referenced yesterday morning were exactly the same challenges that were faced at that time in a post-conflict environment. Uh, I, I think th the, the point of that particular remark is to indicate that when it comes to accountability mechanisms, they may not happen during the conflict. 
They may not be established in the immediate aftermath of the conflict, but it does not mean that they cannot be established at some juncture in the future when the political dynamics of the country and the political dynamics of the international community change. So the model I speak to you about today was and started to function 10 years after the end of the conflict in Bosnia. Next, I'll touch upon structure. That actually will refer to a model that is a national jurisdiction with national legislation that has an international component inserted into it for a transitional period. And I'll also give you an idea of the legal reform that was required in Bosnia to make that happen. And finally, very importantly, I'd like to share with you some of my experience in relation to funding and where we got the uh, uh, international funds from to support the Bosnian War Crimes Chamber. And I shall do that all in 15 minutes. So firstly, by way of background, uh, many of you I'm sure are aware that the Bosnian conflict lasted from 1992 to 1995. During that period, approximately 2 million people were displaced and figures differ, differ but approximately 200,000 people died as a result of the conflict. It was hallmarked by, as mentioned, widespread displacement, ethnic cleansing and a wide array of crimes against humanity and war crimes. In terms of the cessation of hostilities and the peace agreement, in 1995, the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed by the warring factions, and that was the end of hostilities. Importantly, in the Dayton Peace Agreement, an organization called the Office of the High Representative was created. The Office of the High Representative was an organization that had the lead role in the civilian implementation of the peace agreement. Many years later, in 2001, working in the office of the High Representative, we had the mandate for the comprehensive judicial reform of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and also the creation of a state-level criminal justice sector. So, in terms of international actors in Bosnia, there was OSCE, there was the UN, there was an array of excellent civil society organizations. But in terms of taking a lead role on the policy development, the legal drafting and the interventions required to lift something like this, uh, in the country at that time, it was the Office of the High Representative. There isn't an Office of the High Representative in the Ukraine, but again, as I said, I think for constructive discussions moving forward, I suggest people move away from looking to the ICC to build institutions like this and look and identify towards international actors. Who can be your partners in this process and who has a mandate that may facilitate this? They may not know it yet, but I feel that that's something similar to Bosnia that civil society can advocate very heavily for. Moving forward, um, the when and the why. Uh, I, I had a, a discussion um, uh, with Vitali yesterday in relation to Bosnia and in relation to the prosecution of war crimes and economic crime cases domestically. The reality is that from 1995 until 2005, there was either in certain parts of the country absolutely no war crimes prosecutions, or if there was trials, those trials did not meet international standards of due process and fair trial. So in, again, just because it does not happen during the conflict or in the immediate aftermath of the conflict, it does not mean that it cannot happen at a juncture later, uh, which I feel is a very important point for the Ukraine at the moment, because I know you face considerable challenges in terms of building something like this, if you're interested, and also having uh, the, the political momentum and the will behind you to do so. Critically for Bosnia, and this is drawing us into a slight discussion where positive complementarity may come into play. In terms of the catalytic effects, the why this institution was created, 
As I mentioned to you in 2001, in the Office of the High Representative, as directed by the states that created this organization in the Peace Implementation Council, there was enormous concern about widespread organized crime and corruption, as well as the lack of prosecution of war crimes. At that juncture, we embarked on, as I mentioned, a comprehensive strategy of judicial reform. This included a review of the Criminal Code and the Criminal Procedure Code, and it included something quite similar to what is uh, referenced yesterday in relation to the new bill that is before the Parliament, the existing Criminal Code, because in Bosnia at that juncture, there had to be a discussion about if there are to be prosecutions, what and how will crimes be charged under this legislation and the new body of legislation. At that time, ICTY, which is the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, they had from the Security Council received direction that they had to implement completion strategy. In summary, to do that, they had to refer 10 indictees who were in their custody in The Hague to a court that had the capacity to prosecute and bring these people to trial um, and also ensure, obviously, all the due process rights. That was a moment that was extremely pivotal in the creation of our court in Bosnia because we had, at that time, a uniform position of international actors saying, this is something that potentially can be done and we're prepared to fund it. So in 2003, together with ICTY, we brought the Office of the High Representative, the domestic actors, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as uh, representatives of the ICTY together so that we could reach conclusions, joint conclusions. And those conclusions were that the, the Bosnian Prosecutor's Office and Chamber would focus on cases transferred from the Yugoslavia Tribunal, meaning in a prosecution strategy, mid-level offenders. But the National Court would also deal with serious offenders from national indictments that at that point in time, they hadn't been prosecuted. There was perhaps, well, there was multitudes of evidence, but actually no proper investigations and prosecutions. So the focus of this internationalized Bosnian chamber was mid-level offenders of grave atrocities that had been committed during the conflict, as well as the same level of seniority for organized crime, economic crime, and corruption. Moving forward, the philosophy. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the philosophy of the Bosnian War Crimes Chamber was to introduce international support, both financial, logistical, management, and judicial, for a transitional period of time until our Bosnian colleagues were in a position to assume full responsibility and the Bosnian government was in a position to assume full financial responsibility for what had been built. So this model is actually a model of domestic capacity building rather than perhaps the special court for Sierra Leone or the special tribunal for Lebanon, where we see ad hoc institutions that have a specific mandate. And once that mandate is completed, then the court transitions into a residual mechanism. That's not what this chamber was about. The vision was always to build a state institution that long after the international presence was gone, that institution could hopefully continue to process and investigate cases because by the sheer enormity of crimes that were committed during the war in terms of the desire and the accountability that was expected from the population and from victims' communities, you can never do that in five years or 10 years. It's simply not possible in any domestic system. In relation to how it was created, uh, I'd like to very briefly touch upon the legal reform that was required. So in terms of the institutional legal framework, what was required to establish this mechanism was overall a law at state level. 
I think in the Ukrainian context, we'd probably be looking towards a high court or a Supreme Court. In Bosnia, it was the state court. So we prepared, submitted to Parliament and walked through the, uh, uh, the negotiation and the adoption process. A, a law on court and prosecutor's office of Bosnia. In summary, what was embedded into that law was the creation of specialist chambers at the trial and appellate level in this state court and specialised units within the prosecutor's office. In those units, international judges and prosecutors could be appointed not to act as mentors, but actually with an executive function. So the upshot was that during the transitional period of five years, in the trial and appellate chamber, we started with benches, for example, in the trial chamber of three judges with a majority international. And through the five-year period, when in proceedings it was possible, shifted the majority to our colleagues from Bosnia. Part of the reason why that was extremely important and has been analysed was credibility and legitimacy of the institution. The war was hallmarked by ethnic conflict. 2001, it was an absolutely devastated criminal justice system to the extent that there were no prisons, courthouses had been blown up, and again, the structure was ethnically created. So in terms of this new entity, one of the very important contributions of internationals was legitimacy, because the population felt that they, that internationals would be less likely to be influenced. In addition, something I touched upon yesterday was witness protection. Uh, I don't need to um, explain to anybody in this room that there are certain forms of criminality that bring enormous challenges in the prosecution of war crimes and organized crime. One of the key challenges is the protection of witnesses, but also, as I mentioned yesterday, the psychological well-being of persons who are prepared to come and testify, because frequently we are dealing with very traumatized individuals. In that respect, we prepared a law on witness protection and support, again, adopted by the Parliament, which enabled us to have protection services where required, but also in the specialized chamber, support services for witnesses who would come to testify. And those services very closely mirror the services that we see in other hybrid and international tribunals. In addition, we did, to facilitate the transfer of cases, have to, have to open a maximum security 21-bed detention unit, which entailed us also drafting a law on um, uh, detention and the regulations required to incarcerate people to the minimum standards. Um, again, picking up on yesterday, other forms of criminal uh, amendments that were required to facilitate the lifting and the implementation of this mandate, the Criminal Code of Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as the Criminal Procedure Code. There are different opinions from Bosnian practitioners about the value of those amendments. In particular, there was new elements introduced into the procedural code, like plea bargaining, never existed in the Criminal Procedure Code prior to that point in time. Some prosecutors years later supported it, others felt it was still an anomaly and didn't fit in the Bosnian system. The reason why I refer to both of those uh, amendments is, again, to emphasise, and uh, Wayne mentioned this yesterday, the absolute importance of having, as substantive criminal law and procedural law is amended in a reform process, parallel intensive programmes of training for domestic practitioners. And in terms of that training, I think from the landscape and the discussions I saw yesterday, um, there certainly is a space here where I can see that potentially if the bill is successful, that that is something that can be concentrated upon now. Um, again, for us in the preparation for the opening of the chambers, with our Bosnian counterparts, it was training on modes of liability, war crimes, crimes against humanity, 
but very importantly, it was also training our colleagues not from Bosnia how to actually apply the Bosnian Criminal Procedure Code in proceedings before a domestic institution. Um, again, that is to give you an indication of um, the level of work it does take to actually in, in, enshrine in a domestic system an international presence together with amendment of law. Uh, overall, in terms of the Bosnian model, we were looking at approximately two and a half to three years of consultation, drafting, and then the actual adoption process by the parliament. Uh, next structure, very quickly, as I've mentioned, what you had in summary in the Bosnian system was internationals present through a transitional period in the trial and appellate level of the state court. And similarly, in the prosecution office, international prosecutors working together with domestic prosecutors on um, implementation of the national war crime strategy, which was also something that in the lead up to the opening of the chambers was concentrated upon. I mentioned this briefly yesterday. With the enormity of crimes that are committed, it's absolutely essential, and this links to my next point, that there is a strategy who is going to be prosecuted and what are the standards that will be applied to the selection of cases. This is important for transparency purposes, but it's also essential when it comes to seeking funding for models like this. Because when I work with donors to seek funding for models like this, one of the obvious questions is how long and how much? And to actually in a legitimate way speak about this, what is extremely helpful is information from prosecution services of what the intended or forecast workload might be. Um, lastly, in terms of structure, a very important component, again, something that is are similar to other tribunals, is a registry. In Bosnia, in terms of court structures, there was a registry, but much more akin to a court records and a court management office which is absolutely fine if you're dealing with a regular caseload. In terms of the mandate that by law we created for this institution, we, by agreement with the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, created an international registry. The key role of the registry was firstly funding. It was to manage relationship with donors and seek the money to support the institution. But in addition, it was to provide the judicial support services that realistically are needed to deal with cases of this nature. And that is everything from language services, so translation services, if you bring people who are not from the country to the country, you need to have a common language so everybody can function in a court, uh, a court environment. Also, everyone needs to be able to function on records that are translated. It's a huge service that's required um, and it needs to be managed, a registry function. Very critically, as I've mentioned already, witness protection and support. Additionally, the court management function. I noted yesterday that at the moment there is a lot of documentation of the alleged crimes that are being committed. At some point in time, when you move into proceedings for the effective management of proceedings, it's extremely helpful to have that digitized and to have a unit that specialized in actually being the custodian of the records in an extremely secure manner, because this is obviously where most of the strictly confidential information is kept. Again, I'm not familiar with the court structure here in the Ukraine, but I would strongly advise that if you are looking towards designing an international model, or a national model with an international component, um, look towards having a strong registry for the purposes of helping with supporting funding and also, as I had a discussion yesterday and as Eric has pointed out today, um, the, the, the notion that um, persons who are not from the country who come to work in the country, i.e. the brand of the international, will come without problems is, is chronically flawed. 
um, uh, it does not mean that um, you're going to have better practitioners. There may be practitioners with different experience, it doesn't mean they're better, um, but they do need to be managed. And it is, uh, in my opinion, very, very helpful if you have a registry function that can manage not only the funds, but the human resources that are coming to support the domestic system. Lastly, to touch on funding. How much did this entity cost and how was it designed? As I've mentioned to you, the political consensus was reached in 2002 to build the war crimes and economic crimes chambers. Um, at that point in time, we had to sit back and we had to look at strategies. Who is going to be prosecuted at this state level? What's the workload forecast? And how long can we convince donors to work with us on this project? So we held our first international donors conference in 2003. What we did was identify a group of states who in their political statements appeared to be the strongest proponents of both the reform of the criminal justice sector in Bosnia and the completion of ICTY. We brought those states together and at a donors conference, we had presented to them and lobbied them in advance, but we brought them together. The first time we brought them together was in The Hague. And we, as the managers of this project, had set a threshold and indicated that if they wanted us to proceed with the implementation of this proposal, we would need $15 million for the first two years of programming of this system. It sounds like a lot of money. What is in there is also the reconstruction of a courthouse and the construction of a detention facility. Because as I've mentioned to you, one of the challenges in Bosnia was infrastructure. There simply wasn't any after the war. Thankfully, at that donors conference, we did get approximately $16.1 million committed for the first two years of funding, which meant that we could aggressively build the institutions and get to work. In 2005, we held a second donors conference for the funding of the last three years of the project. This time we had approximately 42 to 43 states attend, and we held that conference in Brussels with the support of the European Commission. Again, it's a constant element of work. Once you get the commitment to proceed with these programs, at all times, you need to have someone who maintains a focus on the funding and the continuous funding of it. Lastly, and again in a discussion yesterday, um, would I do anything different and did I learn any lessons? Yes. <laughs> um, I've spoken to you about a five-year transition program. The reason why we had to have and a number of years in terms of transition was because the potential donors would not agree to go into an open-ended project. It was something that, that understandably they needed draft budgets before them for their capitals to consider the scope of work, but also to be able to assess, is it working, is it not working? And that's how we settled in negotiations on five years. If I was to do this model, I have done building again, but completely different model. If I was to do this model again, I would strongly recommend that rather than setting five years, the withdrawal completely of internationals, I would keep the transition process, but I would have a comprehensive review after a certain number of years. Because what we experienced in Bosnia was ultimately people who are not supporters of the institution, be it because they possibly have committed war crimes or be it because they are very heavily invested in other criminal activity that waited out the presence of the international community. So once the internationals were taken and withdrawn from the institution, the political attacks on the institution escalated. And at that point in time, to get the momentum of support that we had in the building phase was close to impossible. So one of the key lessons learned is I would support a transition process, 
but this time I think I would suggest that rather than an actual set date for the removal of the international presence, rather have a comprehensive review date so that domestic authorities together with responsible international actors can decide if the domestic system is ready to proceed uh, by itself. And on that note, I will complete my presentation and hope my remarks are somewhat helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. A very learning uh, experience for all of us. Um, at the same time, I'd like to say that perhaps Eric was quite right saying that it is very important for any model to speak of the national, to think of the national legitimacy. What you've heard now from Fidelma, the project that started after signing the Dayton Agreement in Ukraine, the conflict is ongoing. There are no peace agreements just yet. Many people think that creating any models might limit the scope of search of a conflict settling measure. Second, Ukrainian society understands very deeply that we don't have an ethnic conflict. What we have to deal with is aggression from a neighboring country that wants to have something similar to Dayton Agreement for Ukraine. Our country is being federalized increasingly and a group of people becomes more powerful in decision taken in our country. With this model, a peaceful agreement might might already happen. But we, Ukraine wants this peace agreement wouldn't wouldn't want to be it that that expensive, like uh, losing our independence, losing our territorial integrity. This conflict is unique in terms of annexation of the part of Ukraine by a neighboring country and this is nothing like Bosnia or Sierra Leone nothing like those scenarios perhaps the only parallel after World War II is uh, annexation of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein that lasted for quite a short period of time No legal solutions were made, only military solutions. So, this conflict is complicated, meaning it's so multitasked that it's difficult to find a single instrument. But Ukrainian society has an inquiry to address the accountability for grave crimes to someone meaning the grave crimes during Maidan. It's been five years ago. There are no replies, there are no solutions to this in the society. It's very important to engage national participants as much as possible. Our yesterday discussion showed that we have a motivation to investigate these crimes. Legislation is being changed and it's very important to find those directions that bring national work with international perspectives. I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Roman Martinovsky now. He was one of the members of the group that worked on the Ukrainian version of the book. Um, Roman was a military judge. He was a lawyer from Crimea who was forced to leave the peninsula after it was annexed by the Russian Federation. And now he is uh, the head of the regional center for human rights. So Roman, please. Um, what is your opinion about these lessons? What could be the important things here? Is there a chance to approximate national 
and international mechanisms and how can we move on with this discussion in mind and challenges uh, before the Ukrainian society. Please. Thank you, Roman. First of all, I would like to say that it was an honor for me to uh, accept the invitation of the Renaissance Foundation and join um, the group working on this very useful handbook um, which reflects the experience of um, accountability for grave crimes. And I would like to say that I would be extremely honest that over the past few months, me and my colleagues were living with this book at heart. And uh, I'm looking at the authors of this um, groundbreaking work, not only with respect, but with uh, um, a bit of a jealousy. They created this, uh, uh, this book, but uh, we raised it as a Ukrainian here. And I'm really honored um, to see how this uh, making of, of our work um, is in the, is talking, how this child of ours is talking uh, in Ukrainian. And um, I'm very happy to, to see this child uh, speak the language, which is understandable for Ukrainians who would like to act and who would like to make decisions with regards to international justice. And I believe that many of those who have joined this process will, um, who are involved in this process will read um, the publication. And I also hope that the, those in power will read this book as well or those who will come to power tomorrow will also read this book as well. And I hope the decision makers will also read it. The problem with our government, I will, I'm talking about the independence period, is denialism. And it's unique thing to observe during almost 20 years how new nihilists in power are trying to fix the mistakes of the previous generation of nihilists. I know that there's many lawyers, judges uh, in the parliament in Ukraine, but the Ukrainian experience shows that just having a law degree or even a status of a judge, a prosecutor or a lawyer can coexist peacefully with the evil which I call um, the nihilism, the legal nihilism. Going back to what's happening in Crimea and in Eastern Ukraine, I would like to say that the response and uh, attitude of the international community in ICC to this issue is surprising to some extent. Of course, the atrocities at the African continent with millions of those who uh, died from hunger, sickness, were victims of rape and killings, they called for the reaction of the international community. But the events in Crimea and eastern Ukraine are, in my opinion, maybe even worse because the citizens staying in the occupied territories, their, um, their brains and their hearts are, are distorted, they're mutilated. Almost two million people were displaced. Crimean Tatars are going through everyday horrors in Crimea, are activists in the occupied areas also. Isn't it horrific enough for us to act swiftly, promptly, and collectively. I heard yesterday that at this conference that people want to know the truth. They want to know what happened. They want justice. They want to see perpetrators before the court. And it is true. Many people do. 
but in my personal opinion so far I think that the majority of society does not care they don't care what happens and they don't care what will they don't care what will happen to the country in the future let's be honest they cared in 2014 they cared in the February of 2014 now five years later the number of people who who don't care has grown a lot unfortunately I think and yesterday people asked questions what to do and how to continue I think that the efforts of the civil society of, of course we, sh we should uh, try to impact the, those in power but today we should also direct our efforts not only at those in power but also at the society in general because otherwise um, it is the rule of corruption, impunity, and nihilism continuing. These words can characterize any of our presidents or in any of our governments. Only active society can clean, um, can purify itself. It can control the government and keep the government in check. So what do we do? I've already mentioned it today. I think that we need to admit um, mistakes that took place before, long before 2014. To admit the mistakes in 2014 and onwards. And only after that can we go back to a dialogue with society. This was my remark uh, before the conversation about how we can uh, take the experience described um, in Options for Justice and um, can be applied in Ukraine. During the preparation of this book, we, even before it was published in English, we have looked at uh, experiences when we worked on our concept for the use of separate uh, transitional justice mechanisms in Ukraine. This is not specifically a transitional justice concept in general. It was a narrow component of it, but a necessary component of it. We were thinking about the accountability mechanism for the grave crimes committed uh, in our country. And we structured our document in a way that it includes the background of the problems it is created to solve the description of the mechanism the necessary legal amendments the time frame and other issues I don't want to say it is flawless and when I was uh, editing the Ukrainian version of this book uh, of course, uh, I reflected back to to what we did back then with from a different uh, point of view. But in general, I think the approach that we selected, and this approach is mostly based on on the Bosnian experience. I think this direction that we chose, it was actually correct therefore what were the problems that the concept 
we have developed aimed to solve. First of all, we were talking about overcoming the discrepancies between the national law and the international humanitarian law. We discussed that a lot yesterday. There has been some steps taken so far, but there are many other issues. Today, I think the training training of judges uh, related to high corruption crimes and conflict related crimes is inadequate and insufficient there are problems related to corruption within the justice system within the judiciary the reforms that are taking place they cannot immediately overcome this problem but the speed of the reforms is extremely low there is lack of credibility uh, public credibility of the um, decisions of the uh, courts even the supreme court first had high level of credibility but now as it continues to work this level has been lower and lower this relates to all of the reformed system. I mean, the national police had very high credibility level at the beginning of the reform, and then it has gone down. There is a big problem of excessive caseload of courts. There is another problem of lack of protection for the parties to the judicial proceedings. We, were, we offered a hybrid uh, judiciary uh, mechanism and creating a high court uh, for the special crimes. This is a working um, title. I will explain what special crimes uh, entail, but for now I'll use this. We could call this court a high criminal court. It would be a first instance court uh, dealing with this category of crimes. When we started working on this concept, we were hopeful that this court would replace the need to create the high anti-corruption court. We wanted to see a single court that would look at both high corruption crimes and international crimes and other grave crimes. Unfortunately, this was not the case and today we have a, a task of creating a separate court. There are certain issues related to the constitutional restrictions, in particular when we're talking about international judges working in this court. There are certain restrictions in the constitution and in the law about, about the courts. The latter is a little bit easier. Um, but the constitutional restrictions are, of course, more difficult to overcome. When we started to work this concept several years ago, we didn't take into account amendments to constitutions because there were restrictions during one uh, sitting, during one period of uh, the parliament, a limit of numbers of amendments available. We understand that we won't be able to solve this issue within the uh, upcoming months, but the new parliament, the newly elected parliament, will be perfectly fit to make these uh, amendments to the constitution. During cassation and criminal court, we wanted to load them with the functions of court of appeal concerning cases that usually went to uh, to courts as uh, grave crimes. I think we should refuse from the constitutional procedure, cassation procedure uh, and leave only two instances, the first instance and the uh, appeal, court of appeal. We also have had other options of creating chambers, but I wouldn't like to delve into that a lot. Uh, I think the option that I shared with you right now is the most relevant, uh, the most applicable concerning the mandate. 
of course, we need to define the peculiarities of certain crimes, the characteristics, the key characteristics. Of course, these are cases that are especially hazardous for a person, for the state, or for humanity in general. The severity of crime, for instance, the cons by the consequences or by the subject, for instance, a civil servant of a higher standing or military man. Also, another criteria was the scope of crime and the international nature of the crime. So these were the criteria for, for bringing them to a certain mandate within the mechanism. Of course, this mechanism cannot work in a fully-fledged manner if we don't have a good investigative system. Now, back to the capacity of our justice system to investigate these crimes in a duly manner. Yes, we do have such capacities, but without an international mechanism to this process, it will be very difficult for us to produce really relevant and correct decisions. So the investi without international elements, the quality of investigation will be so low that the activity of court will be basically blocked. We will have acquittal verdicts one after another and um, there will be no stopping of it. We should strengthen the capacity of our investigative system and here we we suggest using uh, the international component. Why do we keep saying this? Why do we try to convince you of this? If relations between national judges and international judges are built in a proper way, then the international experience will be accepted and will be engaged in Ukraine and transferred over to the next generation of judges. Of course, the problem is uh, in the several mechanisms it didn't work because the relationships between national and international judges, between the counterparts, their relationship was difficult. We should pay attention to this problem right away. Of course, judges who will work within this mechanism will face all the time serious problems related to their own safety and security, their physical protectedness of themselves and their families, so we should physically protect them and take measures to, to ensure their security. We had another idea. Our constitution doesn't allow foreigners to be Ukrainian judges, so we thought about engaging the juries, the jury, to this system. Of course, this institute of juries should be transformed to make it workable within the framework of this mechanism. We need to make certain amendments to the criminal procedural codes and to the law on justice. so that foreigners can act as lay judges. In that case, we might avoid the necessity of making amendments to constitution. The proportional number of judges in this mechanism should be to the favor of the international component. Later, this uh, could be changed step by step to the moment where all international judges can be excluded from the team. Let me make a little, a little detail. In Ukrainian model, the lay judges is also kind of a hybrid model. It's not very characteristic for you, the Ukrainian system. The lay judges may have the same rights as a professional judge that takes decision collectively. Yes, lay judges have the same authority as judges. That's uh, pro, uh, pro. That's among the pros, among the cons. 
a lot of criminal procedural code and law about justice have to be made to adapt this institution to Ukrainian reality, to Ukrainian mechanisms we're talking about. I can go on and on, but no, 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 I am keeping the minutes. I, I know we're short on time. I have to be brief. The concept we're talking about foresees financing of this mechanism, funding of it, selection of judges, engagement of judges, control from the state that delegated, uh, from the states that delegated to re representatives, support and protection of uh, participants, and preliminary work with the donors. Again, in our opinion, it doesn't matter how good this concept is, if it is not accepted by the society, first of all, we can't force them, we can't create the political will. So, in my opinion, after the work on this concept is over, even after it's presented, this concept is presented, we'll have to do a lot of awareness building in this society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So, we've had three various approaches to accountability for grave crimes. The prospects of various models, we've heard about the practical aspects of these models. And of course, the prospects of uh, assessment of Ukraine's needs. How can we tailor these models to the to Ukraine's, to Ukraine's requirements, which is uh, very important. There is no model that can be automatically transplanted to, to a certain country. It's very important to understand that the scale of the problem is uh, quite large. Yesterday we discussed how difficult it is to qualify the crimes. If you remember uh, the um, re research that we uh, that you uh, that we mentioned in our printouts from the uh, from IRF assessment of justice system of Ukraine to be proactive during the conflict in the east of Ukraine, it has many that printout has many interesting summaries. Most judges in Donetsk and uh, Lugansk regions uh, that uh, work with cases of terrorism and grave crimes, those judges themselves are IDPs. Their property and relatives are mostly on the territory controlled by another state. So this vulnerability can be used in uh, any in, 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 in a way. We do not wish to undermine the professional level of these judges, but we can't overlook the fact that it makes them vulnerable. We've seen a gap between three of the very practical and important cases, issues. The first relates to the anti-corruption activity and the attention of the donors was about what can be done in Ukraine now, how to fight high-rank corruption. We created two institutions, National Anti-Corruption Bureau and Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office, and very soon, in uh, September, the Anti-Corruption Court will uh, start its operation. It was our donors that helped us settle this. The International Monetary Fund supported us financially and set this as necessary conditions for our further cooperation, and we know that in Ukraine. Another format of decisions we need for investigations that are ongoing within the five years of time of the armed conflict. There are investigations of the military prosecutor's office, the prosecutor's office of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. These authorities are exercised by various pre-trial bodies uh, all over Ukraine. Here, a question of special education preparation. What is done to prepare the prosecutors 
a little bit less attention is given to investigators and detectives, and the minimum attention is given to judges, to courts. There's the third issue that we're about to face very soon, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. After we regain control over the occupied territories, the issue of legitimacy of decisions that were taken now, for instance, that's what we'll face. Now they're using the criminal code of USSR that still has death penalty and God knows what else. And the question is, what should we do to this solution to the decisions to the people who are in, who are sentenced now according to decisions of DNR and LNR courts? How should we rethink, re rework these decisions and the legitimacy of these decisions with uh, the population of those territories? See, the scale of this problem, the scope of it, doesn't allow us a universal, all fit-for-all solution. We all aim to make a strong cooperation, but there are certain limitations and restrictions to what we can expect. So understanding the needs and understanding that Ukraine has an individual capability in the of legal community is uh, much higher than the institutional capacity. We can, uh, we can launch a discussion on various solutions and I really hope that this research will be helpful and useful to be a foundation, the basis for the um, contemplation, for the thinking process. It will help us create our inquiries and address them to our partners. This is an inquiry from institutions, the intellectual, the academic circles and the politicians. Now I'd like to engage you, the audience, to the discussion. You've heard the presentations. Now let's start with the Q&A session. Let's make a round of questions and have comments, discussions all time, types of reflections on anything you have w upon upon hearing all of our speakers. So, please raise your hands. Who has questions? How many questions do we have? One, two, three, I see. That's it, right? Three questions, please. Super, super panel and uh... Eric, in particular, your, your book is, as I've said to you before, uh, the Options for Justice paper is just fantastic. It's an amazing, amazing document. So many, many congratulations. Um, my questions are actually uh, mainly for Fidelma. I, I have two. One is in terms of uh, sort of the leverage and the golden moment. I guess you can talk from that. Uh, oh, you can't hear me. Um, one is more about sort of um, what was the, the leverage and the leverage moment for the BH setting up that sort of tribunal because I assume there was a, a sort of moment when that became possible uh, and I wondered if you could just expand on that slightly because um, there obviously had to be a willingness of the authorities to, to do wondered what were the sort of reasons behind that and what 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 what, what sort of spurred that on uh, as the catalyst that'd be very interesting and the other question related to uh, what you were saying about donors and the need for a prosecutorial strategy I guess sort of a level of completion strategy, but my question is more, at what point does that sort of, do, do the donors start driving that process more than the prosecutors and their strategy? Uh, and how does that, is that a risk? I suppose it must be a risk, but was it not really an issue? I'd, I'd just be interested to, to hear from that. Um, and finally, from my, my colleague, uh, uh, Rome, couldn't catch your, your surname, but I would be very interested to hear a bit more about uh, the issue of uh, domestic uh, the, the political will amongst the community and how important that is uh, and also how you would be able to sort of convince the local community or to uh, engender sort of the political will of the community around a mechanism whatever that might look like because uh, that, that does strike me as a very crucial aspect as you said I was really struck by that thank you very much indeed. Uh, 
Тут два питання вже поставлено, надамо на них відповіді і потім перейду. We have two questions uh, so far, let's answer them and then we will move on to the other ones. Your questions. Um, <coughs> in response to your first question at the moment, uh, in Bosnia, as part of the comprehensive judicial reform program that I referenced in 2001, at that point in time for the Peace Implementation Council, which is approximately 72 states that set up this Office of the High Representative, uh, there was extreme concern in relation to endemic and widespread organized crime and economic crime and corruption. And that was driven because it was also a post-war reconstruction process for Bosnia. So in terms of looking at the, the picture, the environment, foreign investment was not going to happen when you had challenges like this and collapse of rule of law in that respect. So in prioritization, we, as the individuals working in the organization responsible for the reform, we advocated very strongly both. We wanted both a, a hybrid engagement for organized crime as well as war crimes. The appetite in 2001 was stronger for organized crime. So initially we got the green light to go ahead with the implementation of the organized crime hybrid chambers. Now, very importantly, and we got seed capital for that. We were in the hundreds of thousands rather than the millions, but we did get support for that. We had states that seconded prosecutors and judges. The absolute critical catalyst for the expansion of that program of work to the War Crimes Chamber came in 2002 with the joint approach by us with ICTY. Because effectively we were able to say we have the blueprints for a justice model, but we don't have the political will or the funding. And as a result of a joint approach in terms of member states, both from IC2Y and ourselves, it was we can do this and we can build the model so you can transfer 10 indictees to us, which means you'll accelerate the completion strategy. So again, uh, I think what's important in that is there's huge challenges. You may have, it's not going to happen now, come back to me in a year. But in terms of, of design, um, be clever. And, and I think already you are, you have concepts, you have a, an anti-corruption court that's coming. And clearly there's, uh, there has been thought given to how in the Ukrainian system, you could introduce an international component. Uh, which, again, very, very important. It's just a matter of having really strong advocacy. International NGOs, together with national NGOs, can play a seminal role in that, um, together with approaches to uh, embassies and donors and others. Uh, secondly, in relation to the prosecution strategy, um, obviously, and very importantly, and this comes to credibility, the prosecutorial discretion to decide who will be prosecuted and when they will be prosecuted goes to the core of their independence. And frankly speaking, donors don't and should not have a role in terms of deciding who will be prosecuted and when they will be prosecuted. However, as I've indicated, when it comes to designing models like this, it's not realistic to expect that you can present yourself to a group of donors and not have a forecast of workload. Um, how we did that in Bosnia was, there was a prosecution office, it was the state prosecutor's office, and with international prosecutors who had worked in the Yugoslavia tribunal, uh, they came for periods of time to work with their national counterparts to share some of the strategies that had been used in the ICTY in terms of how to deal with the widespread nature of the crimes. So ultimately what was developed was a strategy based on regions and the state prosecutor's office divided the country, I'm 
five regional divisions, so five teams covering five regions, and then a special team for the genocide that was committed in Srebrenica. That gave us the ability to speak with donors about the resources we'd need to staff those teams, and then also what we could see as a forecasted workload, which changes. It's, a, it's an evolutionary matter. But no, there wasn't influence um, by donors in terms of the selection of who would be prosecuted. But again, I think this is a very important note. That's why when you look at models like this, having a registry function, um, as registrars, we're responsible for overall administration. So we can represent chambers, judges, and prosecutors, and defense in terms of working with states to uphold the independence of our institution, but to hopefully secure the funds we need to make it actually function in accordance with independent principles and equal support for all organs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'm not uh, an expert on creating political will, but if I can speak about our vision, about how to convince the, the government and the society about what needs to be done, it's not only a question of creating the hybrid mechanism. It is a question of in the realm of transitional justice over uh, in general. It requires the reform of all areas of state activities. I think we should suggest specific options, options for a mechanism. The next is that we have to understand that in both post-conflict societies impunity uh, is especially uh, has a special value in post-conflict societies a special meaning in post-conflict society. We need to work together with the authorities and the public. One, I, I could talk about training, and we have met uh, with the authorities uh, at the events uh, related to ICC, and they expressed concerns that our military will be prosecuted by the ICC. So the prosecutors didn't have an idea uh, or don't have an idea and um, some of the mistakes they're making is due to the lack of knowledge of the IHL, the, the lack of knowledge of the um, experiences of the mechanisms we've, we've described before. We should definitely engage the academia and work in, with the as victim associations. I think at this point we're not really using this mechanism enough. Also international influence and t when we talk about communities we should use dialogue, explanation and discussion. We have many organizations working with communities in effective way and I think we could establish dialogue with these organizations directly engaged with communities to convey the knowledge and also convey our suggestions. I think the formula should be quite simple. We need to create a concept of I know, I understand, I do with the authorities and for the communities, the model should be I know, I understand, I demand. When the community demands and when the society has enough knowledge, then we can form political will. Thank you very much. I would also add here an important aspect is that political decisions in this field occur from time to time. And we can't say that political elites are don't care at all about 
the legal um, assessment of the events uh, that uh, could amount to grave crimes. Remember, during Yushchenko's presidency, Holodomor issue was raised to political level, through, first through political decisions. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs was tasked with uh, achieving resolutions from parliaments of many countries on the recognition of Holodomor as genocide. And that happened by, in several states and also the Ukrainian parliament made a decision, adopted a resolution, but after the political opinions, there was a judicial opinion of the Supreme Court of Ukraine related to that. At this point, um, the, it is of high interest what uh, the pro prosecutor's office of Crimea is investigating now related to the deportation of Crimean Tatars in the 1940s. So, uh, in my opinion, what was the impetus of, of, this, uh, of this investigation was the persecution of Crimean Tatars in Ukraine that's happening now, that kind of led to this look at what happened in the past and the prosecutor's office of uh, the Republic of Crimea is working on this and I'm very much looking forward to to what evidence they're going to collect. I know they're, they're um, investigating, they're interrogating witnesses now and at the moment it is a pre-trial mm -hmm. stage but when it goes to trial it'll be very interesting. So in this regard Ukraine has very interesting developments and I think um, unfortunately uh, they don't uh, receive the deserved international attention and also I also think that these cases should also become um, uh, should also draw attention of the public in Ukraine and also that not only the historical crimes um, matter for Ukraine, but also the modern grave crimes, especially given that the national justice can potentially reach the perpetrators in this case. You had a question. Please give the microphone. Is there any anyone else who would like to ask a question? Let's have take questions and then we'll go to answers. Thank you, Roman Martinovsky, for, for your presentation. You've raised important issues. One of these issues is the two instances for the court system. The first instance is the appeal court. But if you look at the system now, the first instance is the district court, then the appeal court, and then the court of cassation, then the fourth is the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court, and then the fifth one is the constitutional appeal um, by a citizen to the constitutional court. So, in fact, uh, uh, the person, an individual, gets tired of this long process and and stops caring about it. So, the question to the international expert experts: We've talked. Uh, about the uh, question of international uh, tribunal for the past two days and I think we've stepped beyond this and we should look at the judiciary of Ukraine and as Roman have rightly pointed out perhaps we should introduce the uh, first court and then the second court of appeal and as a th third, third level it could be ECHR or ICC. I would like to see, to hear your uh, uh, expert opinion on that. Not only those uh, in the panel, but maybe Liz can, contri can contribute, Kevin, Paolo, maybe Emmerich could also contribute to that. Please, would you give another microphone? Okay, my question is, in fact, we're talking about 
large extent, but I'm talking about Ukraine. There are two localities of conflict, Crimea and Donbass. And at Donbass, there are the so-called Minsk agreements, the protocol on uh, fulfilling uh, these agreements approved by the Security Council of UN. It includes the amnesty for people uh, related to events in Donbass. So what about the Minsk protocol and the opportunity of further criminal prosecution due to what happened to Donbass? Good afternoon, Liana Moroz, IRF. I have one comment and one question to Ms. Fidelma. The comment is, I'm maybe one of the few people in Ukraine who read this handbook from A to Z with Mr. Roman, and I am impressed by the amount of work you've done. This is unique and very useful for the stakeholders to choose and implement the model that is uh, most applicable to Ukrainian context. My question to Ms. Fidelma, because we've had heated discussions on the Ukrainian model, and we had a question how to ensure engagement of high-quality international elements, uh, international foreign judges, prosecutors, how should we, in how could we ensure high quality and high training of these uh, people? What's your experience from uh, Bosnia model of a uh, chamber for prosecuting for grave uh, crimes? Who of the panelists would like to con start answering the questions? Um. Maybe I'll, I'll say something about the question about getting good internationals, because I think it's an important one. Um, and there, so many times it's gone wrong. So when you set up an international accountability mechanism, uh, that is going to attract a number of people who want to work there from the international, you know, judges or uh, investigators, prosecutors, for a variety of reasons. There are those who want to come because uh, they feel passionately about the mission and they want it to work. Those are the kind of people you want. There are others who are there because often these positions are overpaid uh, using the UN system. Um, there are those who want to come because Kiev is a lovely city and uh, it's, a, it's a vacation, paid vacation. You don't want those people. Um, you know, and it, it's more complicated than that. People have mixed motivations. But when you're recruiting internationals, I think it's as important to probe the motivation as it is to probe the expertise and, and their uh, track record, uh, their work history. Um, or at least you should be also be looking at that element of their work history. Uh, you know, how motivated were they? Were they um, there for the right reasons in other positions as well? Um, and that goes for judges as well. I mean, and in Bosnia at the beginning, uh, the international judges were seconded by the state, by states, by donors. Um, and that changed over time because Bosnia at the time was reforming its uh, High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council um, to, to improve and professionalize their own judiciary. Uh, and at some point, the international judges coming to the state court of Bosnia, um, it, the recruitment process shifted and they also had to be picked by this newly reformed body that was looking at the merits of application. And by, I think, many accounts, the quality of international judges improved when this Bosnian entity that uh, was quite credible was doing the selection process and it wasn't just states choosing judges. I mean, if you look at the International Criminal Court, that's all you need to know about the quality of judges you get uh, if it's left to states to decide who, who goes to these things. Um, and so I think that's one thing. So, and uh, ensuring you're bringing people who are willing to learn as well as, as well as impart advice, right? So not just to come and be the, the big expert. I'm the expert on international criminal law. You know, I worked at this international tribunal or that one, and I'm here to tell you Ukrainians how to do it. Um, but people who are willing to come and say, you know, I have something to contribute, 
but I want to learn from my national colleagues. Uh, I want to know about Ukrainian criminal procedure, right? And I want to I want to be involved in the details. You want people with that mindset, and I think through the interview process, you need to look at that. I'll drop my note. To follow up on what um, uh, Eric has mentioned and to hopefully answer your question. Um, so Eric has touched upon the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, which played a very important role uh, in the selection process. For the Kosovo Specialist Chambers that I now am the registrar of, in the building of this particular model, when it came to the recruitment process and selection process of judges, uh, as a methodology, what was used was states were asked to nominate and could nominate more than one candidate. And then separately, there was an independent interview board established. And that board was comprised of some of the most senior judges from the international criminal justice arena over the last 20 years. And they interviewed, they shortlisted, there was 98 people that applied, they shortlisted to approximately 42. They interviewed the 42, they re-interviewed a number of people. And through that level of scrutiny, what was avoided was a state simply seconding somebody. So it was actually a legitimate selection process. And I agree with Eric, I think that's incredibly important. And I think if you have the correct selection panel, including individuals who are peers, you can really get some very solid results in that respect. Unexpected results, but very solid results. I'd also touch upon the governance of whatever is created. It's extremely important that you have a code of conduct for staff, so individuals who are not from the Ukrainian system and perhaps who are governed by Ukrainian labour law, you must have a code of conduct that regulates them, that's an inherent part of whatever contractual relationship you have. And critical, in my opinion, is also a code of judicial ethics. So that if in the event there is issues that arise, we always hope there isn't, but if there is, you have a governance structure in place. And then again, also to speak towards motivation, incredibly important. One of the key selection criteria that we looked at in the Bosnian model was, yes, qualifications, but also was the individual willing to learn and be trained in domestic law? And um, one of the tasks and responsibilities that was enshrined in that model was the expectation by management that you were also there to work with and where necessary train your colleagues from Bosnia so that you didn't come to the country to create a job for yourself for 20 years. You came to implement a transition plan and part of that was to work with and train where necessary your counterparts, not simply to take a parallel direction and do everything uh, by yourself. So they would be some of the recommendations. And if I could touch on the gentleman's question in relation to the uh, multiple levels of the Ukrainian uh, justice system. Again, as mentioned, not every model, you have, to, you have to make a bespoke model. I personally very much support what Roman has, uh, has noted, which is bringing the, the model to a trial and perhaps a pellet level. And then um, in terms of, uh, uh, well, certainly human rights protection, I'm sure that the constitutional courts of the Ukraine has a critical role to play in that. And in that, I'd like to just quickly touch on the Bosnian system. Again, at trial and appellate level, international presence, the Constitutional Court of Bosnia did receive referrals alleging fundamental violation of human rights by those chambers, so the chambers that were internationalized. And very importantly, when those remedies were exhausted, there has been cases of the war crimes chamber taken to the European Court of Human Rights and adjudicated there. I feel that's extremely important because I feel that goes towards the legitimacy of the institution and working with the population 
to basically explain it's not just decided by random internationals that come to the country. There is a, a broader protection uh, mechanism which includes the Strasbourg Court and that's something that, um, as mentioned, there's very interesting jurisprudence from Strasbourg on the Bosnian model, which also goes to the retroactive application of the criminal code and um, non-use of a more lenient sentence, which directly relates to conversations that we had yesterday. Thank you. Uh, Roman, would you like to add something quite briefly concerning the selection process? the selection process, uh, there is a problem. It will be easier to select the judges or to appoint them at v for very short periods of time and check whether they uh, live up to expectations and uh, prolong the contract or uh, denounce it. But during a short period of time, the judge, it, it, it might be quite the period of time might be too short for the judge to flourish and to show what he is able to do. But on the other side, if they uh, prolongate the uh, seniority for about five years, then uh, the, it, 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 it might breed mistakes as well. So we should find this perfect balance and give the opportunity to, to the judges to show what they're capable of and how prepared they are to function. Another thing concerning the selection. We're talking about a mixed court system, mixed court. We should use as a criteria what is the previous experience of the judge with the other judges, with other mechanisms. If this if if this experience is negative, I think that might be we might think twice before appointing this judge to this to this hybrid court because um, it's very important for this judge to be able to communicate with national judges. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Now we are moving to a very specialized issue about motivation, about selection issues. I think. We are at a stage of continuing the discussion. On the other hand, side, I'd like to su support Fidelma's point. Even if we engage international prosecutors, lay judges, judges, anyone, and uh, help them bre breed the capacities of national judicial system and not just uh, think about their own career prospects for the future. Quite recently I've talked to an American prosecutor who was sent to help train the staff of anti-corruption investigations. When he saw how the Ukrainian prosecutors work, he said in our country, the corruption is very simple. Here, the schemes are so complicated. And when I saw how much work the Ukrainian prosecutors have to do with the scarce resources that they have, I'd be happy to send my stuff to train, to be taught by Ukrainian, by their Ukrainian counterparts. See, it's just, there's this reverse flow. It's not a one way road. We should share expertise with the foreign counterparts as well, which creates added value. National and international expertise will result in a completely different, better quality. So we finished with the Q&A and in fact, we're almost finishing our meeting. Are there any comments? Hmm. Please raise your hands if you have a comment. Please give the microphone to this um, gentleman. Please make it uh, five minutes max. I would like to thank for this wonderful conference and uh, 
wonderful handbook which has been published I have two reflections I'd like to make. First is that the law that has been approved in the first reading and we hope will be adopted into law will not be a possible to use directly because there is a strict ban on the non on the retroactivity and the on retroactive application of law we, we don't have the implemented article 7 in our constitution of the european convention in our constitution so we only have a direct ban um, on the retroactive application, I first see significant challenges in the future in relation to the case related to the deportation or recognition of Holodomor as genocide. Uh, the reasons here are similar. We need to amend Article 57. We need to amend it with part two of Article 7 of European Convention. So that we have the possibility to conduct prosecution for the acts considered uh, crimes under the general principle of law. Um, even if they're committed before they were criminalized in the national legislation. That is first comment. The second comment is a bit more complicated and a bit less uh, obvious. It refers to the situation when war crimes or crimes against humanity are committed by the Ukrainian side of the conflict, the military forces, the volunteers. I work in this field, uh, we collect information in this field, we've documented a lot and our, our side has tortured prisoners, has killed prisoners and also engaged in indiscriminate um, shelling of civilian objects. In, in Pervomaisk, in the city, uh, in Lugansk region, in 2014, there was significant shelling. There were also cases when our plane has simply bombed uh, the entire street in Stanitsa Luhanska and was completely destroyed. And there's a lot of, there's many victims. Our society does not want to hear about these incidents and we have to understand this because in our understanding what Ukrainians understand as crimes against humanity and war crimes, it is necessarily by the occupying power, by the terrorists, by the separatists, etc. This is the perception. So we all need to seriously consider what we're going to do with this because because the, um, our recognition of all crimes is not accepted by the so-called patriotic community who is ready to forgive everything um, if people have uh, defended the country. And in practice it happens, people who committed grave crimes receive very mild verdicts. They're released very soon. We also have, we can talk about it for a long time. But I would like to say that personally, I have developed this position. If we omit looking at crimes committed by our military, We will only slow our progress towards victory in this war because we will simply do what the Russian world uh, is doing. 
by, by launching this aggression. So to step away from this Russian world, uh, we need to understand that these, these crimes cannot be committed in a free and democratic country. And if they are committed, then accountability should be um, a definite um, option. And I think we need to work towards this direction. We need to help Ukrainian society understand that these are um, impermissible. And if they are committed, they should, the perpetrators must be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I don't think there is a need to discuss. I think in two days we've talked a lot about the categories of crimes, about uh, accountability, and also about the um, the need to prosecute for grave crimes, and it, regardless of which party to the conflict has committed, all of these should be investigated and prosecuted by a competent, um, impartial tribunal which can issue an enforceable judgment, um, which would be also recognized by Ukrainian society and by international community. This was what we have been talking for the past two days. I thank you for this attention. I thank all the participants of today's panel. I hope that uh, you have discovered um, new you will discover new and uh, interesting uh, things uh, on the pages of the handbook. The English version is available on the Open Society um, uh, webpage. The Ukrainian version, both uh, volumes are available on the webpage of the Renaissance Foundation. This is not our last meeting for sure. We are searching for the right model. We're searching for partners. We're talking about the need for the um, proper understanding of the scope of the problem to then move on to the design of a future model for Ukraine. I hope that there has been enough information uh, during these two days for, for all of you that all of you were able to learn and also to network. I thank everyone who has arrived to this conference at the invitation of organizers from afar and um, for sharing your experiences. I hope you have also have uh, developed your understanding of the Ukrainian contest, context, uh, so thank you. And we have um, an opportunity for networking and I invite you. To